Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. Julie, it is March 5th, and we had a fantastic week. Yes, we did, and happy Friday, and happy Friday to all of our listeners. And this marks the 10th consecutive day that we've had a morning uh, clubhouse event. Indeed. Which I'm really excited to see. The audience is steadily growing, and it is such a cool format. I'm not going to ramble on about clubhouse. You asked me not to, Mm -hmm. uh, because we sound like we're, you know, essentially doing commercials for clubhouse. But as far as opportunities to have unfettered access to information. It's fantastic. And what I'm really excited about is in our clubhouse in particular, we're attracting some really phenomenal, um, mm-hmm. you know, not all of them are coaches necessarily, no. but we're, we're attracting some folks that are not, uh, they're basically at the top of the game, top yes. producing agents and brokers. Agents, brokers, there's some mortgage people on there. Yep. Um, I think there's some transaction coordinators, you know, that's why they call it Clubhouse. We're all in the same club, basically. But the co- the question, and I like to start out over every club room, and I only intend to have our clubhouses in the morning go for an hour, but they almost <laughs> always go 90 minutes or two hours because yep. people, they love the discourse. But the, I always try to ask, or I go to every clubhouse and I'm moderating it, trying to have two or three questions at the ready. And I've never once got past the first question of whatever it is because people just love to drill down on it and just really, you know, Hash it out, hash out whatever the topic is. So the top, the question I asked this morning was, uh, you know, and again, remembering that most of the people that are up on our virtual stage are going to be top producer types. I said, what are the, what was my question? What are the mistakes that you what, made? What would you do differently? Oh, now, that's right. Looking back. What would you do differently now looking back if you had to restart your entire business? You know, like if you were just starting from ground zero. And uh, the answers were fantastic, mm-hmm. honestly. It, it, and one, in, one guy in particular came on. He'd been in the business for over 50 years. And um, we, I think our paths had definitely crossed with, uh, with him back in our Howard Britton days back in the 90s. But uh, you know, he was explaining, and he was really heartfelt with what he was trying to explain to the audience. He was trying to let people know in the most sincerest of ways where he wished he would have made different decisions. And um, where it all came down to is this one question I like to pose to, frankly, to coaching clients primarily, but I offer at this same, uh, you know, thought process for all of you as well. If you have to choose, and if you and you do, by the way, if you have to choose between famous, or let's say a more modern term that maybe you guys can understand is, if you have to choose to be an influencer or you know forward slash famous or being rich, which would you choose? And so um, after hearing him, uh, you know, answer the question originally about the things that he wished he would have done differently, I then asked him that question. I said, so I think his name was Dave or Mike or something. John. John. Yeah, you're right. John. And I said, so if you were 25, if I'm asking the 25, uh, you're, you're 25 years old and I asked you the question, you know, if you have to choose between famous, you know, forward slash rich, I'm sorry, famous forward slash influencer. Again, I'm trying to help all of you move past words. If you say famous, that might trigger some emotions and thoughts in your head, which aren't in alignment with the question and, and the thought process I'm trying to share with you guys. So if you need to use the word influencer, go for it. But if you have to choose between you know, a, a being a famous forward slash influencer type or being rich, which would you choose? And at 25, he said, I would have chosen, and I did choose, actually. He corrected me. He said, I did choose famous. And, and I said, well, explain that. And now remember, this guy is in his, I don't know his age, but he'd been in the business for 55 years. So this has to go back to this early 70s, really. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I was always chasing the awards, the plaques, the recognition. I always wanted to be number one in my town. I always wanted everyone to see you know, me as number one. That was my name, main thing. Those weren't his exact words, but that was the essence of it. Okay. So I said, now you're 35 and I'm asking the same question. Which do you choose? Which, and he said, again, which did I choose? He said, I chose to be rich. He said, I stayed on that. I'm sorry. I chose to be famous. I stayed on that process of wanting to get recognition, wanting out, you know, people to see me as being successful. I put my ego, and this, these were his words, ahead of what I should have been doing, which is fam- uh, focusing on wealth building. And then I said, okay, 45, then what? You know, famous or rich? And he said, I still stayed on that path. And then I didn't ask him about 55 and 65. I didn't want to ask him his age. I think he was in his 70s. 
And um, he told me, he basically said it wasn't until he said, I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't until fairly recently that I realized that I'd chosen the wrong path and that I should have chosen uh, to be rich. And again, rich is where your money works for you. You no longer work for your money. But the essence of his answer was, for me, it was emotional because it was so honest. And I just, I hope and pray that people that were listening to our clubhouse, and I hope and pray that people that are listening now, you guys understand that. You can't, like, the people that are trying to sell you that wealth follows or any sort of financial security really follows being famous, it's a lie. You got to be really, really careful about that, especially in, um, in real estate. Now, I, you know, Julie and I live here in Dorado, Puerto Rico, and there's a lot of, you know, fairly famous YouTube influencer types which were that are moving here. Um, some big names that you guys recognize, but I won't bore you. Now, they originally uh, chose to be famous, and because of their the format that was available to them on YouTube and whatnot, some of them did become rich. Okay, now, but what's the difference? They were entertainers in essence. That's what they're doing. They're providing entertainment. You're not an entertainer. You're someone that's supposed to be providing real estate transactions. And the way you get rich selling real estate is you have to have profit. So, I mean, I know that sounds trite, but that's ultimately what he was describing, what he was explaining that he did for his entire career is he would sell lots and lots of houses. And he indeed was number one. He indeed was the, uh, you know, the, uh, the top of the heap in his, in his world. He had accomplished his goal of being famous, but in order to do so, he spent all of what would have been his profit. Well, you know, into, uh, you know, reinforcing the idea that he was this, you know, big someone. And he said he spent all of his money on all this branding and all this marketing. And and remember these ideas that you guys have not been in the business long enough to realize all these things that you're sold into believing that you need have been the same garbanzo beans that have been sold to agents since, you know, obviously since the seventies. Right. (laughs) And these are just marketing companies that are saying, I mean, back when Julie and I were selling real estate, which, you know, seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't, you know, it was bus benches. It was moving trucks. It was talking house. It was all these things that nobody ever stopped to try to ask, you know, no one asked the question, okay, will this actually put me in a position to help people and will this actually make me net profit? Now, some of the ideas will put you in a position to sell houses, but because the thing costs you so much to do, you have no net profit. And as you're uh, maturing as a business owner, assuming you stay in the industry long enough, you survive long enough, you will discover what I'm saying is true. And if you don't believe me, believe someone that's been in the business for over 50 years. Because the reality of it is, is you do have to choose which path. If you have to be, um, you know, 10 years from now, five years from now, if you would, what would you rather be? Well known and broke, <laughs> or would you rather choose to be maybe someone that's known for doing a great job, but never tried to be an influencer or really famous, but has lots of assets and his money is financially secure for the rest of him, his or her life? What would you choose? Because you can't have both. The probability of you having both is about zero. And here's the ultimate fallacy and a lot of the you know crap you guys are being uh, the, sold to believe is that when you spend all of your money on this social networking stuff and all your time on this on this you know pursuit of becoming an influencer or being famous you don't realize that a those things do not result in paychecks there's no direct correlation between all that stuff and actually making money but you're also building your mansion or your business your castle on somebody else's ground and like uh What's his name? Um, the guy that's moving here, the big wig influencer type. I can't remember his name. Something Paul. I don't remember his name. Yeah. But he's moving here. He's a guy who's 25. He started out creating content for the Vine, which was, I guess, a social networking thing. Well, Vine went out of business and he lost all of his content. Um, you know, boom, gone overnight. And then he moved all of his, uh, not Jake Paul, but his brother. Jake Paul's his brother, the other guy, the other something Paul. Jordan? I don't know. Who who knows? We're not into that. But so so then he moved all of his content to YouTube, made new videos, became even more famous. Um, I actually know the guy who helped him do all of his, uh, essentially building all that. And supposedly he made something like $50 million inside four years. Uh, but he's but essentially what happened then is he made a video and YouTube essentially kicked him off YouTube. So he had built this huge following on YouTube and just with a snap of a couple of fingers, all that following basically was taken away from him because he had built his castle on someone else's land. And he had also spent, I'm sure, a tremendous amount of money to basically, uh, you know, build that level of uh, recognition and, and of influence. But again, he's an entertainer. You're not. So you guys are following business models with regards to social networking and stuff and believing these things that people are telling you. 
that are predicated on people creating a big a personal brand. Are you familiar with all this? Because you're going to monetize it basically in the back end off selling, you know, makeup or whatever. And I know this sounds confusing if you guys aren't. Um, well, it is confusing though. I mean, think about. Because it's an elegant lie. That's sure, why. But it's so prevalent. Okay. It would be easy to believe. It would be easy to be confused. Right. That if you just pumped out enough social media and you had enough followers and you had, you know, all that kind of thing, that wouldn't that naturally lead to people wanting to do real estate transactions with you? But that's such a leap. Okay. And, And I appreciate that you said those types of influencers who are making that kind of money, they are entertainers. They are selling fairly literally themselves, right? The the entertainment of them, what they do, their family, their adventures, whatever. Totally different than trying to do all of that and expect somebody to think of you for real estate. Exactly. It's not the same. Right. And you're in the services business. They're in the entertainment. And so the people that are selling you, including one of our biggest competitors, honestly, the people that are selling you into believing that's the path you should follow, what they're doing is they're listening to the Gary Vendrichucks of the world who are essentially consulting, uh, you know, who basically have then uh, followed this big influencer path. And how does an influencer make money? How do all these guys make money? They make money because uh, YouTube and whatever will sell ads on their videos and whatnot and but they become professional entertainers that is really what it is and and so this is where it gets confusing because you think and and you're being sold to believe that that translates to how you build your real estate business and it's not that's the lie part so let's go back to the gentleman that was on our clubhouse event this morning and he was talking about how he wished he would have chosen to be rich versus famous so in his day, it was probably postcards. It was probably all kinds of different offline, because there was no online things, that he was wasting his profit on to build the perception that he was, um, you know, that he was famous, that he was in, in that, okay? And he spent all of his money on that. That same iteration is now happening with online stuff. And that's where you guys have got to have really clear thoughts. And so his conclusion was he wishes he would have built a business where his profit, where his product was indeed profit. And he also said he wished he would have spent more time building relationships. That's the other thing he said, which was kind of emotional. Uh, to hear. He wasn't the only one saying that. Everyone I, said I, it. Everyone was saying that. As right. a response to your question, what would you do differently if you had to do it over again? Right. You know, the response was spend more time on the relationships that you've been building and less time trying to always create the new next thing. Yeah. And I, I see, for example, I'll see on... Um, various different things that I'm stumbling across that like agents are flocking towards learning how to generate online leads from some new gimmick or something. So let's say they're not trying to become influencers or mm-hmm. they they haven't you know bought into the idea that they're supposed to be somehow the mayor of their digital town or all this other hooey that's being sold to agents. So let's just say, for example, they don't know how to lead generate and so they're spending tons of money on done for them lead generation. Well, I mean, and that conversation came up today on our clubhouse event as well. And it, the question I posed to the group is, do you have have to wait to become a listing agent. And as a listing agent, don't you ultimately have to, you know, what we've always say is beat buyers off the stick. And they all sort of laughed. They laughed mostly because new agents or agents that are new in the business, maybe, you know, 15 years or less, they don't realize how easy buyer leads are to generate. If you just do offline activities like open houses, like going out and listing a house, like doing things like 1-800-HOME-HOTLINE.COM. All the things that you guys spend money on are free if you just learn how to do them. Um, and the whole, all these businesses and this whole industry of selling all this digital stuff to you guys, it's all predicated on you, frankly, not having enough business maturity to discern the truth from you know elegant BS. And, and that really is uh, the point that I think he was making today and I heard come out of our clubhouse event as well. Do you, did you pick up any other yeah, little nuggets? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it might have been Kevin Yoder that said um, – you know, like right when you get in the business, eventually you hear the saying, you have to list to last. Yeah. Right? And and we say that all the time. It's really true. You have to list to last. And he said, you know, isn't it interesting that there's no sayings like that about buyers? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting how we all kind of settled on similar themes. And I think that's a, a big value that Clubhouse can bring to people who haven't been in business for 55 years and to hear from somebody like that, his perspective to say, and not just him, a lot of other people had similar answers that, you know what, you have a choice to make. You are in control of those things. You don't have to just do what, you know, the rest of your office is doing or what somebody sent, sold you in your email this morning as the easy well, button. But so that's that honestly, when I, and again, I hear the pain from all these agents yeah. and I see them asking their questions 
and I read this, it's constant. Uh, you know, I just got my real estate license and I am having to, uh, you know, run from all the people trying to sell me all this crap. Sure. How, what am I supposed to do in my you real estate You still have room business? on your credit card. They're yeah, going to come after you. Exactly. Actually, I'll tell you something interesting, listeners. There was a study done, and this was done quite a while ago, uh, that was trying to figure out, it was one of, again, one of these companies that was trying to sell stuff to agents and they were trying to figure out what the average agent in the United States can budget per year to spend on um, something like they called business development or something. But the essence of it is what's the average agent's, uh, how much money do they have per year to spend on you know lead generation, branding, stuff. marketing, whatever, stuff in general. And the number was like not very much. It was like $3,500. And so a lot of these companies essentially built their business models not just on trying to uh, obviously compete for your $3,500. If you're a branding company, your certain tech doesn't want, you don't want that agent buying $3,500 of the leads from Zillow, right? Uh, but they also had, did not build businesses um, with the expectation that you would be in the business for very long. So they were building essentially products that were designed to get you to purchase them, get you to feel that you know this is going to be somehow your hack or your shortcut, two terms I hate. And then they're going to, um, they don't, they're in, built into their system was no expectation that you would be a repeat customer. And that's how all of these businesses are built. They build these one and done products because they know most agents won't last. They won't survive. They won't develop enough business maturity to realize that if they want to, you know, essentially have ever increasing levels of success, they have to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it at the highest level. People get into the business. And so agents, when you're getting into the business or, you know, here it is spring in the world, in the United States again, and all of you coming back into the business, maybe you've been in the business for a long time and you're faced with that same question, what should I do to generate leads? Well, if anybody's coming to you and trying to sell you something, which is supposed to eliminate rejection mm -hmm. from your life or is supposed to somehow make it so you don't have to have a lot of skills, you can pretty much assume that what they're selling you is exactly like what I just said. It's something to make you feel a certain way, to get to separate you from your money, and then whether, you know, there is no attachment to whether or not you have long-term success with what they're trying to sell. I know that sounds really brutal, and some of you guys might be offended that I'm saying that, but you need to you need to test it yourself, right? So find out, is this product that you're thinking about buying, is it to placate your fear of uh, rejection? Is it to uh, placate your desire for recognition and to feel famous? Uh, is that what it is? Because if it is, they're just basically manipulating you. Yeah, well, I use the filter. How many steps away are you from actually being on the phone with what they're supposedly yeah, selling exactly. you, you know? So the further you get from real communication, probably the crappier the system is, right. you know? And I mean, if all that worked so well, they probably wouldn't be so, so going after the new agents all the time. I mean, that's, well, that's an indicator that well, sure. they need that churn replaced. One of the questions that we posed this morning is when you're deciding to hire a coach or any kind of anybody selling you anything, you have to run, you have to have really, really high standards. Um, and it's so obvious when I say these three things, I'll just go through them relatively quick. So if you're planning on hiring a real estate coach, let's say, or even doing business with a real estate coaching company, the first question you have to ask is the, you know, the head Kumba, did he ever or she ever sell real estate before? And if they didn't, that right there should be... That's that, your only question. That's your only question. You're done. There is no moving to question two because they failed question number one. So if they never actually sold real estate before, never had a real estate license before, you should immediately uh, rule them out as far as doing business with them. Number two, because doesn't that just make sense, by the way? Number two... If they had a license before, you can move to question two. And question two is, did they sell at least 100 houses in a year? You know, have they actually, they weren't just licensees, but they are actually successful licensees. Okay, good. So now you found one that checks both the, you know, answered yes to the first two questions. Now the third one is going to take 99% of them out. Did they sell over 100 houses per year at a high, you know, for, for years? Not just for one year. But for at least five or six years, were they successful at selling over 100 houses per year for at least five or six years? And if the answer to that one is yes, well, then you probably have someone worth listening to. Yeah. So and I even add to that, uh, ideally, if they're doing that kind of volume, you know, year in and year out, also somebody who has experienced a variety of types of markets. Yeah. You know, that they because they there's probably, I don't know, four or five years now that if that was all you knew and you killed it in this market, and we saw it before with the boom turning into the real the housing crash, that, you know, an even stronger coach is somebody that not not just survived something like that, but really found out how to thrive very quickly. 
and has that flexibility because that also is an indicator that they'll be able to coach you differently, you know, as needed, that they're not like their own one spoke wonder. It's not just coaching, though. I want to expand yeah. this. It's to, it's doing business with really anybody. If you're going to go to the gym, if sure. you're going to if you're going to hire <laughs> any kind of you know financial professional, whatever, don't you want you, you deserve you, you're paying your money. Get the best that you can, but have very, very high standards because the ram the negative ramifications of hiring someone who's never sold real estate before, maybe someone who sold real estate but never sold at a high level, never sold high, at a high level for a long period of time, the long-term ramifications are massive. Well, that was stated on Clubhouse. Several yep. people said, "I, you know, a big mistake I made in the beginning was I didn't know how to choose the right coach. Right. And I, a couple of them said that they just kept on, you know, for a year or two and that that was a lot of wasted time and money. Uh, again, I'm going to, Julie keeps on focusing on coaching because that's primarily what we do, obviously. But again, I'm going to suggest that you do this for anybody that's trying to sell you anything. So if you have somebody, and you will, have 10 people message you today trying to grab your attention so you can, you know, buy what whatever it is that they're selling. Um, like I, I'll tell you the funny ones I get because, you know, Julie's an EXP agent. So we get these random phone calls and there'll be these, uh, you know, guys trying to, oh, are you an active agent? I have seller leads available in your market. Yeah, right. Whatever. <laughs> Let's move I know. on. We, like to torture you know, them we, get, we get, a, we get a lot of, you know, a lot of solicitations and I know you guys get solicitations sure. like that too. And I can see why you'd say yes, because you don't know how to generate your own business. And so if someone's offering you the business, well, okay. So you're going to then buy a seller lead and that seller lead's going to be a mediocre, a best seller lead that they're also selling to 20 other people. And now you have to compete for the li listing of an unmotivated. You guys get the point. You have to learn how to generate your own business. You have to accept the fact that what you want in life is on the other side of having to do a lot of what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Not just a little bit. You're going to have to suffer. There's no such thing as uh, you know success without suffering. You're going to have to, again, you know, I was listening uh, to, to a uh, gold medalist, and I, I shared this the other day, I think, mm -hmm. where he, a gold, you know, I think it was, it was the Olympian, and he was talking about the fact that, um, you know, basically he spends 90 per, or spent, he's no, he's retired, but he spent 90% of his time absolutely torturing himself. He said he'd have to work out every day to the point where he'd make himself physically ill on a regular basis in exchange for basically earning the right to uh, compete, let alone win a gold medal. And that was only something like, so maybe an hour worth of, you know, celebration and having actual one. I mean, if you think about like a, a Olympic sprinter, that guy's going to be, a, what, four minutes, five minutes of, of the limelight, uh, yeah. hopefully followed by a, a, a medal ceremony. That's a lot of work to get to the point where, where it's like six or seven minutes worth of pleasure. And, and But that's really what it takes to be the best at anything, which should be the pursuit of all of you, becoming the best version of yourselves as real estate professionals. So I really, really would hope and pray that all of you have the, you know, your synapses connect so that you finally realize that everything you want in life is on the other side of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. And there are no shortcuts, but the world is going to constantly be trying to manipulate you through your innate lizard brain desire for recognition to for of, of belonging it's not going to these guys are not going to tell you the truth about because maybe they don't know by the way maybe they're just you know shiny light you know bug no, light hired, chasers hired to sell something right I mean, that exactly doesn't mean that they know much about it they might just be a good salesperson uh, so i'm going to share something else i learned uh -huh. yesterday there's there's and i've seen this guy's ads there's an ad i i don't remember the name of it and even if i did i'm not going to mention it there's this uh every year it happens the beginning of the year there's some new fitness routine guy that somehow, you know, deciphered the exact way to lose weight. And it's a it definitely you can make a fortune telling fat people how to be skinny. And by the way, the advice is always the same. But where a lot of these guys are monetizing nowadays is they'll essentially say, I've decoded it. I figured it out. And really what they're trying to do is sell you supplements. They're not, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to sell you on recurring revenue, trying to sell you supplements. Like supplement subscription, basically. It's, it's again, it's the, it's the omnipresent secret sauce shortcut mm -hmm. thing. I mean, it's this, it's literally, you take a pill and you'll lose weight. That's where all of these types of things go. So I was reading somebody that took the time 
to uh, study um, this one particular, you know, new weight loss guy. And this guy's probably in his 20s and he absolutely looks amazing. And he's talking about how, you know, what I'd rather have pizza or salad and the whole thing. You guys have seen these commercials too. Well, it turns out, and whether this is true or not, I'm not sure, but just what I read, that that guy was an actor that these internet marketer guys hired to basically play the role of some fitness guy that created this, you know, secret sauce to basically lose weight. And so the whole thing is contrived. So there were four or five of these internet marketers. They hired this actor guy. They've written him scripts, very well written sales copy. They then make him famous through basically, you know, schlepping these uh, the, essentially, again, pseudoscience ideas around weight loss and getting in shape. And their whole value proposition is ultimately buy these supplements. When you watch these commercials, you're going to think, well, it's just basically teaching me how to work out, maybe eat right. No, what they're trying to do is back end it with selling supplements. Nothing wrong with that. If, I'm just telling you, though, that that is exactly the same types of things that are uh, prominent in the real estate realms too. These are internet marketers who are creating essentially these fake realities around the products. Perceived that, need, basically. Perceived need. They're, they're just silver bullets. They're just take this pill and you'll lose weight. It's just buy this product and do this and you know the sellers will call you. That's all it is. It's the same gimmicky crap that's been around forever will always be around. You know, and so you guys have to see what it is. Intellectually, you have to see what it is. And when you do see what it is, um, you have to uh, unplug the ego and the emotions. Otherwise, you're going to be um, like our new friend on the clubhouse this morning. You know, you'll be in the industry for over 50 years. And I don't want to use the regret, but I definitely heard regret in his voice. You'll be regretful of the fact that you chose the easy button and you chose to pursue fame and allow your ego to basically rule the roost. And you didn't choose to be rich. Because with on the other side of rich, where your money works for you, you no longer have to work for your money, where you can become financially independent. That's where you can have the greatest impact um, on others. You know, there's no – any problems that a rich person have uh, has are never as bad as the problems of, that a poor person has because ultimately when you're rich, you can write a check and you can make the problems go away or at least you can dissipate them. Yes, that's absolutely right. So I think that – one of the summaries from this morning's session was that you can do the, you can try the easy button, but ultimately it actually makes everything harder and take longer. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's on the fine print under the easy button if you turn it over. It right. That. Well, this is but actually going to prolong true. your pain. Oh, you mean the easy button from those <laughs> yeah, uh, the yeah. commercials. staples yeah. or whatever it was? <laughs> I know, but it, it's, you know, I think that it, it's great that, that people can hear from those who have gone before them, but what would be even more awesome is doing something about it, being proactive, you know anything proactive uh, lead generation is going to be in the beginning hard, but long-term much, much better for you. And it's it's not even remotely as hard as people who don't do it make it out to be in their head. And so the question we asked yesterday is what was the thing that you, uh, what is the hardest, th what is the thing that, what was my question? What was yesterday? the hardest thing you do that has the highest impact on your day? Every day. Every right. day. And it's yeah. funny, but did you notice that the nature of the answers to both the questions from yesterday and the question from today mm -hmm. were very similar? I did. And I, I also noticed a little bit of a gravitation towards trying to answer the question, what I know I should do. Right. And you always had to come back to, no, we want to know what you actually do. Right. But, you know, there's some coaching in that too, or there's some insight to that. Well, it's because when you have people on a panel, they always try to go to this lofty sort of, I'm, you know, I, the air I breathe is different than the air you yeah. breathe. Somehow I'm superior to all of you. And I hate that because it's such, it's it's yeah. fakery. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're on a panel, if you guys end up being on one of our panels on Clubhouse or any of our live events or just anywhere, just remember. I'm not going to let you get away with trying to say things that are trying to sit. You're, you're saying things that are make that are designed to make you look a certain way opposed to, you know, you're trying to appear as some guru or coach versus trying to say things to help the people that are actually listening. Well, that's why that question is so good. I know. Is what there's two parts to that. What do you actually do daily that has the highest impact on your day? Yeah. That, that's different than, you know, tell me some stuff you've read about that maybe would make my day go better. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, I think it's more personal. I think it's more honest. And it caused a lot of introspection on that question. Well, so the other thing that's fascinating too is a lot of people that will know the truth, mm -hmm. but they'll be in environments where they feel almost socially uh, pressured to say what the popular answer is. Oh, yes. And I've seen that happen a lot. So you'll have somebody who does do their business the right way. They have built their business around proactive lead generation. They have you know mastered the art of pre-qualifying, mastered the art of presenting, mastered the art 
of uh, you know negotiating. And yet they will go on to some of these events. And I'm, you guys see this all the time in live events. You'll have like five or six people up on stage. And even though you have somebody that's building their business around being of service to others and profit, when they're up on stage with all these other big ego types that are bragging about their branding, the, even the person that's doing it with the most profit will feel the pressure to change to their blend. answer because it's the trendy answer. And, and, and that's the other, again, there's so many interesting things. I hope these, I hope people in the, the real estate industry are, are going to realize what happens then it's an echo chamber. So people start passing along the same bad information, even though they themselves don't do it. So the most successful agents, even when they're in front of other people, they're going to feel pressure to talk about social networking and influencing and all that, because that's just what's trendy well, and they you, don't want to seem obsolete. Exactly. You don't want to seem like you're outdated. Right. Yeah. And so, so they talk about the trendy stuff. And and I don't know, it's fascinating. And I know some of these things that we're talking about that Julie and I talk about. I know they don't resonate to all of you. And you know what? That's fine. It, it, it won't resonate with you now, but you're going to remember in the future that you heard what we said. And you're going to be like that gentleman this morning. And you're probably going to wish you would have made different decisions. Because as you get older, the one thing that becomes really obvious is all the attention grabbing stuff and all the things you did to try to make yourself feel successful, the plaques, the awards and all that stuff. It'll come, it'll go, but you can't ultimately it means nothing and no one will ever remember uh, you know, all the people, all the the recognition that you're pursuing for people you think you're going to walk down the street and people are going to say, "Oh my gosh, there goes Bob. Bob is all that." 10 minutes later they're going to think of something else. It won't matter and you will regret having spent the bulk of your life pursuing something that was 100% ego, ego fakes, e- ego trying to you know make yourself look a certain way or feel a certain way, where what you should have been pursuing is being of service to other people and then obviously learning the skill sets that are necessary for you to be of service to another, enough people. You know, Julie, we have to work on how to explain this concept mm-hmm. because there's so many more people that we can help. And I just sure. feel, because you and I are the only, we're the lone voice saying what we're saying. Mm-hmm. And so many other people are saying things yeah. that are absolutely contrary. And some of the other stuff, the branding stuff, the team stuff, the you know all the internet marketing stuff, it's almost become like a religion. I and, know. and when you say things in, around some people that's anywhere counter to what they their religion tells them, they get emotionally pissed off. They do yeah. not want to hear anything other than yeah, they take the it way as to, an attack. Right. And and then guys, look at the big team model, for example. And I challenged the group this morning with that. So what's the point of uh, selling, uh, of being in the real estate business? Is it to make profit uh, for, so that you can reinvest that profit and become rich? Or is it just sell a bunch of houses so you can win a bunch of awards? And the, the big team model, that's another thing that's totally and completely dysfunctional. And we talked about that a lot this morning. Were you listening to that conversation? I got, I caught about half of that, yeah. So, I mean, I, we can summarize it basically. Well, and, and also, I mean, there is a reason that uh, there's a pretty big chunk, probably 25% of the Harris Rules book, we go through, you know, a not dysfunctional setup, right? And we start with what's the lifestyle for a solo agent? What are the pluses and minuses if you're just running your own show totally by yourself? Then we talk about maybe a partnership, whether that's husband and wife or, you know, uh, parent and kids. What's the advantages and disadvantages and how might you set that up so that you get the benefit from that? What's the lifestyle of the, the dual agent? and then a small team and a big team. And we actually hash that out, how that could look for you. And it doesn't talk about, oh, it's time to scale. It's time to, I'm building a team right now. I have to build a team, you know, without any real uh, impetus for that. I, I think it's so easy for agents to think that that's the next step. That's what I should be doing. That's what um, well, Jonna said that. She said yeah. one of her biggest regrets is that basically she uh, you know, succumbed, oh, yeah, I heard her talk about she that. succumbed to the pressure to build a team and she uh-huh. realized how much time she wasted doing that where she should have just spent on becoming a more powerful listing agent. Yes, I was so that's, glad she said that. And that was the succinct, truthful answer, right? Sure. But so, well, why do agents chase that pursuit? Because you're being told to, because you don't ask Well, this because you think it'll be easier. Well, that I don't honestly, I don't think that's the real reason why they do it because they're being told that's the next natural step. It's like going from elementary school to middle school to high school to, you know, college to then graduate school. They think that that's how they're supposed to progress in their career. They think that their careers are benchmarked by forming a team. What your career is benchmarked by is the profit that you make and the money that you reinvest. So here's a little breakthrough that some of you need to have. Selling real estate does not make you rich. Selling real estate does not make you rich. Julie, what did I just say? (laughs) It does not make you rich. Right. Selling your transactions do not make you rich. It's what you do with the profits that makes you rich. Which assumes you have some. Which exactly is the problem with most brokerages. 
and uh, teams. There's not enough profit to actually produce um, enough you know, free cash flow to reinvest into passive sources of income. And again, I want you to realize when you're following some of these, you know, these currently trendy uh, pursuits, what is the output? What are you trying to accomplish? What is it that you're really hoping to get by taking out that ad or doing that particular, you know, if building a team? What are the profit margins? Ask that question. Yeah, nobody ever asks that, do they? And that's the thing that I was really, I, I mean, I, it, I know why they don't ask. Because when you're in a, an environment where you're hearing people preach about uh, you know, teams and team building, the people that are preaching about it are also trying to sell you, literally sell you in some cases, information, products, services, coaching, consulting, whatever, around team building. The one question that you must ask before you start any of those pursuits, like if you're going to buy a product, the answer after you've run the, the seller of the product through the three filters we gave you, the next question is going to be how long before I make a 5x or 10x or 20x return on my investment. So if I'm going to spend $1,000 on this, I want to know, Mr. Snake Oil Salesman, at what point will I get a $10,000 return on this? And you know what the answer will be? No answer because Re- results may vary by re- participants. Exactly, because they're not going to be able to. They're not going to be able to guarantee you anything because their product is the way they make their money is selling it. They don't have any attachment to the outcome of you buying the product. That is really the the thought you need to have, Julie. You need to start a direct mail campaign. That, by the way, is retrending again. I know. You need to start an off in mailboxes. No one's doing it. You need to start a direct mail campaign, right? Blah blah blah. Well, okay, before you do it, a whole bunch of questions you should ask, but the most important one is, okay, Mr. Direct Mail Branding Expert, how long before I actually start to see results from the direct mail campaign? You're going to spend a thousand, you know, a $1,000 a month spending, you know, 500 cards to a 500 homes or whatever it is. How long before I actually start, and you know what they'll give you with the answer? Don't know, depends, who knows. And when a year passes and you've wasted all your money, you know, you're six grand in the hole at this point, you're going to call them up again. You know what they're going to tell you? I promise you they're going to tell you, you need to send more. You need to yep. do it for longer. You need to expand the number you're sending to and the time you're doing it for. And, and the same thing goes true with internet marketing. The same true thing goes true with anybody who's trying to sell your branding because you can't hold them accountable for the results because there aren't enough results to hold them accountable to. Doesn't right. this just logically make sense to all of you? So why would you do it? Well, so here's one reason they do it. Confirmation bias, because yep. they know in their heart and soul that what you're talking about is true. However, they can point to that one deal out of the 33 they did last year that came from one of those things. Maybe. Maybe. Right. Okay? <laughs> and because they got that one victory, they want to believe that it's going to work better next year. That's confirmation bias, right? So you and I had this talk, and if you remember this a uh, couple of days on one of our walks, where we were talking about you know, checking ourselves on this. And I think you asked me if I had much uh, evidence that we could be wrong, okay? And I right. said, well, you know, now and then somebody will tell me that they their source for that deal was Facebook. And, and then I'll drill down, so tell me about that Facebook lead. Well, okay, so what it really was was somebody in their past client list or their, you know, their friend from high school who just happened to find you on Facebook and used Messenger as a way of communicating with but you. But isn't that it? I that mean, does not mean that Facebook generated it for no. you. No. Your center of influence and past clients did, which is the first thing we teach you how to do, right? Yeah. That's And it was they're in your Facebook group. <laughs> to Julie's point, uh, they may have raised their hand and asked uh, maybe that you can help them buy or sell real estate. Not Facebook. That was your centers of influence and past clients. But they clients. would call it a Facebook lead. Exactly. So it's confusing. I mean, I think it's much worse on them than, you know, some of the stuff we had to deal with. But yeah, oh, yeah, but I can understand how that would be confusing. Yeah. And so look, guys, the bottom line is there is pla- there is a place for all of that stuff. But you got to realize it's not the real work of real estate. There is a place for social networking. I mean, again, there's a place for all of this stuff, but it cannot replace the real work of real estate. And what we coach all of our clients to do is you start out by building a proactive lead generation business that's marketing enhanced. Proactive lead generation, marketing enhanced, a skills-based business that if you choose to, you can enhance this, what you're doing on skills. For example, you're working your centers of influence and past clients, just staying on Julie's point, the way we prescribe all of you to do it. You're calling them. You're not, you don't have to drip tons of tchotchkes on them. I know that's another thing a lot of you guys fall victim to is you have to drip crap on your clients every single month. This month it's forget me not seeds. In October it's this, and then in November it's pumpkin pies. And no, stop the insanity. Okay, you're you're not publishers clearinghouse giving away junk. Okay, 
picked up the phone and called them, know what to say, how to be of service to them. Oh, I could never be that guy. Well, why the hell not? Why can't you be the person that's calling people up to help them? You don't even have, when you call them up, the conversation doesn't even have to be about uh, real estate. It can be about the fact that you came across a new roofer that's done a great job or did you know interest rates have uh, lowered or did you realize that there's three houses in your neighborhood that just sold and I was so excited to call you up and let you know that your property is now worth you know this. Those types of things that people will always want to talk to you about and then you end every conversation with, oh, by the way, who do you know is thinking about buying or selling real estate in this market that I should be helping? That's and Again, we our whole system is built on you making uh, 12 calls per year to your centers of influence and past clients and always adding to your list. And our system is free, right? We're not trying to get you to subscribe to a CRM that's overly complicated and then getting you to buy, you know, boxes of Mickey Mouse that you're then supposed to become, you know, a distributor of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> you know, that's not what we're asking you to do. Do the real work of real estate. So if you are ultimately someone who's going to be a proactive lead generator, if you choose then to enhance it, Okay, so now you're picking up the phone, you're making the calls, but if you want to have a Facebook page, a Facebook business page specifically, where you uh, drop in your new listings and you talk about you know things that the, your folks might be interested in, go for it. But don't do it in the wrong order. You have to do the real work first and then maybe enhance it with marketing and what, you know with passive marketing. And what you guys are doing and what you're being sold to do is do the branding, the passive marketing first and then you know enhance it with the it, actually you're not even ever told to actually do anything other than that that's that's how you know yeah. sick the industry has come with the advice backwards. on business building and i want you also to be really careful on the whole branding black hole the idea that your brand you're going to build this brand and you're going to buy this brand brand is essentially a modern word for reputation the way you build reputation is you help solve other people's problems and to think that you can shortcut um, the earned right to have a great reputation through a bunch of branding is a lie. It just is. And you will be found out what, as you know, in the unlikely event that that actually generates any leads for you. And then you have to deliver on what you were faking you know how to do. That's no bueno either. Yeah. And this is frankly what I like about Clubhouse too, because when the tall hat, no cattle types, yeah. when they're speaking, even a clear. novice agent can hear through their words sure. to realize basically that they are uh, essentially just winging it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get somebody else that's really, you know, a phenomenal Jay Abraham type or, you know, hopefully if people see us that way, they'll realize that we're legit. And I think that's the ultimate playing field because uh, for people to go and maybe start learning uh, whatever they're trying to learn about. It's not just real estate, obviously, on that app. It's all kinds of different widgets, all kinds of different things you can learn about. But it is such an awesome way to get unfettered access to information, just be careful you're receiving the information or you're you're enacting or you're acting on information from people who are qualified to truly give you advice about what direction to build your business. And by the way, this was not the topic we wanted to talk about yep, today. We can save that for Sunday or Monday. Oh yeah, well um, we'll save it for Monday. But you know, uh, I just wanted to clarify because not everybody listening is actually on Clubhouse. Clubhouse was the catalyst to our topic today we didn't mean to make it about clubhouse okay? right again but, but the thing is that <laughs> what to your point you want to vet who you're listening to if you're on clubhouse you can click on somebody's profile and see you know who is this person sounds interesting let me learn more about that person it's not just people showing up without any way of knowing who they are i just wanted to you know let them know yeah we know that and the, and just as far as again you know i started out by saying that i promised you on this podcast i, I wasn't going to talk you about failed. clubhouse i totally <laughs> failed and we talked about Clubhouse for like 40 minutes. But the reality of it is, is that really what we're talking about is uh, the dissemination of information mm -hmm. to the masses yes. that allows, um, like, I can you imagine, Julie, if we had had that available to us when we got into real estate? Would have saved a lot of, uh, a lot of painful learning, I think. And if you're new in real estate and you're trying to basically, you know, cut through the, the Mickey Mouse that's out there. You know, the bottom line that all these guys said every time they, when we run in one of our rooms every morning starting at 8 o'clock, it's called Real Estate Masterclass, is that they wish they would have focused, won't follow one course until successful, and not bounced around chasing whatever the shiny object was. That is the other recurring, I think, underlying regret that virtually everybody has. Yes. And, it, you know, it's easy to do. So you've got to use your filters. You've got to ask yourself, I mean... I, I've always I've had this conversation I read on something this morning that and where agents post, and it was somebody saying I can't believe that agents don't get paid on a short sale, 
And like my head was going to blow off. Because of course, like, agents. Where, where did you even hear that? I know, <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, who told you that? But the sad thing is that they were then gathering information from these, you know, random whoever it is. Ignoramuses. Who some of them agreed, yep, that's true. Agents get screwed on a short sale. And I'm like, oh, my God. You yeah, know? exactly. Like a surveying on Facebook or whatever it was does not qualify as, you know, getting a good answer. The, the types of questions that drive me the craziest is when somebody puts, they just had a closing. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it's their fourth or fifth closing mm-hmm. and they've saved up like five grand. Yeah. And where am I going to blow it? And where, where are they going to blow it? Yeah. Right. And they post the question, where should I spend $5,000? And I, I see those questions and I just, I honestly feel sorry for them. They totally sure. and completely don't get it. No. Yeah, you should be putting that five thousand dollars towards you know building wealth. Yes. And sometimes, look, we don't even try to decipher or understand your um, your thinking about money. Just don't do it. Don't try to understand why you think what you think and scarcity and abundance and all that stuff. I mean, Elizabeth Riley, who's she's on every one of our clubhouses. You know, she's become very successful and frankly very wealthy, but she is totally uncomfortable talking about it, and I know that. Um, and so like what she does is she essentially delegates the thinking and talking about money to her financial professionals so she can focus on what she really likes to do. And that might be the move for some of you. So some of you, when we, okay. we use the word rich and I know in some really political circles, that's, you know, rich people are seen Taboo. as evil, but here's what rich is. And you, and we're going to round the bend on today's podcast with just this, you know, this one thought, first of all, absolutely get our big book, quit screwing around, just get Harris rules. It's mm-hmm. available everywhere. Um, and yeah, that's going to give you your A to Z roadmap. And we make virtually nothing off the sale of the book. I'm only suggesting you guys get the book because it's going to give you the roadmap that all of you need. Um, so there's that. But really, at the end of the day, rich is where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. It's that simple. So when you have enough money coming in passively that meets, well, really, initially it's meets, but then exceeds your financial uh, monthly obligations, you by definition are rich. You're living off passive income. That's it. And so if your needs are 10000 a month, your whole purpose of your business, obviously beyond being a service to other people, your output, the way you uh, gauge your success aren't the plaques that you get or the adulation you get from fellow agents. It's the amount of profit that you make and then how quickly you create passive income for yourself. Because what you're going to want and listen to what I'm saying, because I promise you it's true, what you're going to regret the most is not having actually created wealth for yourself, especially as you get older. And I'm te- and that's coming from somebody who's going to be, how old, old am I going to be? <laughs> I, a year older in a week. <laughs> I'm going to be 51 in four days, okay? So trust me when I tell you that the greatest gift that, you know, Julie Harris and I ever gave to ourselves is we always knew that was true. And we accomplished that by the time we were 40 and 41. And our goal then was to basically have enough paid off rental properties that we could live off the cash flow. Well, in the pursuit of that, which we accomplished, we also created other things to create passive income. But uh, truthfully, guys, and I said this this morning on the clubhouse, if we had to do all over again and if EXP Realty was around, that's where I would focus. The revenue share model in EXP, those of you who are EXP agents that are listening, if you're not actually actively pursuing how to build revenue share, you're losing what might be the last best business opportunity of your lifetimes. So you've got to be taking it seriously because EXP revenue share uh, will create for you true passive income. Rental properties are not passive income. I mean, how many hours did you spend trying to manage our managers this week on our properties? Too many. The too answer many. is always too many, even if it's a half an hour. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. too much. I mean, we have managers for our properties, but we have to manage the managers, obviously. Yep. You know, there's no – but the revenue share at EXP is about as close to passive as you're ever going to get. So if you guys are at – if you're at EXP Realty and you're not focused at least some of your day on a building your revenue share group, you're making a mistake. And if you aren't at EXP and you're interested in be at, being at EXP and you're looking for the right sponsor – EXP, please do consider uh, Julie and I, because we'd love to be your sponsors. You can have Julie and I be your personal sponsors at EXP Realty. So if you're looking for someone who's going to help you to build your revenue share group as well as be successful in real estate, please do consider us. We'd, we're formally applying for the job of being your EXP sponsor. So hopefully you guys all appreciate that. So this is a topic that we completely, yep. I, I think, but I think, so what would be the takeaways? We want to summarize today's podcast. I think it would be watch very carefully who you're believing, what you're spending your money on, what you're in pursuit of, if the answer is not obvious to you of profit. You know, if that's not the answer and if you can't, excuse me, define it, then you could be following a path that could lead you. What was the podcast we did about the pilots being off 
yep. one degree, by the time you have a one hour flight, you're like 60 miles away from the airport if you're right. only off by one degree. And I think people highlighted that this morning on that session that, you know, I wish I would have done this because it would have saved me years. It would have saved me money. It would have saved me stress and heartache and hassle. So yes, maybe in the short term, it could appear to be a little harder than you would like it to be. But you know, the uh, long-term results are so much more worth that. And so I think that would be one theme. I think another one would be, um, you know, a lot of people did talk about building teams too soon or too expensively. Or How about this? Like building just, a, I mean, here's the summary. Be a listing agent. Build, right. Be a listing agent. And when you're a listing agent, you really only need maybe two assistants. That's that's it. You don't yeah. need a big team. And you can delegate out your, uh, refer out your, your buyer leads and make more net profit off referring those buyer leads to other agents than you ever would if you had them on as, as, as a, you know, basically building an adult daycare, aka a team. Yes. Right. And, and you guys, if you don't know this, you're going to know it as soon as you try to do it. You're going to realize what I'm saying is the truth. Um, and, and look, you can maybe eventually build a successful real estate team, but most likely it's going to have virtually no profit. So why bother doing it in to. the first place? And if you're doing it because you want to feel successful and look successful, then you're doing it for reasons that you most likely will regret the older you get. This is the truth. Yep. And, and the last takeaway was, is do seriously consider uh, having Julie and I as your sponsors at EXP Realty. And I didn't give them my phone number. If you'd like to text me directly to my cell phone, it's 512-758-0206. That is my real cell phone. Uh, again, I know some of you guys call and you don't leave, you know, don't call, just text, you know, because I'm not going to answer the phone ever. And as a matter of fact, my voicemail says, don't leave a message. Too many, you know, just text. I will respond to the text, usually the same day, sometime within like a minute. So text me directly at 512-758-0206 if you guys are ready to join eXp Realty and you're looking for the right sponsor. Um, you know, 512-758-0206. And yeah, I would say what my big takeaway was from today's podcast mm -hmm. is um, for me, it's a uh, continuation of our life's work. Mm -hmm. And you and I are finally, I think, having a large scale breakthrough in the real estate industry because the break because the real estate industries had to go through a painful agents in particular ha had to exercise um, an exhaustive number of easy button options. Yes. And the ones that we've That's seen true. in the past really 15 years have been some of the, you know, the best well conceived, most elegant buckets of BS. I that know. I've ever Some seen. Some of them are pretty elaborate. Yeah, pretty elaborate. And you guys thought, well, this is the fight. This is the solution I've been looking for. I can finally just hit the easy button and go down this path or the other path. And I'm seeing all of those elegant lies essentially work themselves out of the marketplace. And I'm really finally seeing a lot of people who are starting to be honest about all the the fallacies that agents have been told and sold for for decades. And, yeah. for, and maybe it's just in our little echo chamber because those are the people we attract to us. Those are our podcast listeners and people that maybe. buy our book. But for me, it's a um, an affirmation of sorts. Sure. That's not even a strong enough word. I, it, I know exactly how you're feeling. Well, yeah. describe how I'm feeling. Yeah. Well, that, uh, yeah, an affirmation, I guess, would be one way to look at it. And I think some of this is also us reflecting because of our big birthdays coming up next week yeah. uh, of our life's work and the things that we write about and talk about on the podcast and and the success of our coaching clients and our listeners. You and know? ourselves personally. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, in a sense, it's kind of like a group celebration in a sense, Maybe. You know, on one level, but cathartic. also also a cathartic, a group introspection. And I think that um, it makes me happy to, to, to hear them all connecting with each other because, you know, especially coming off of a year of COVID, right? People can feel very isolated in this business. You can feel like you're the only one having those thoughts and having those struggles. And that's why it's that much more important for you to connect with people that inspire you and motivate you. What I'm really excited about, mm -hmm. what really makes my, uh, I, look, I love the guys that have been in the business for a long time, guys and gals have been in the business a long time who are coming around, but I, I feel their regrets, to be honest with sure. you. When I hear, when I have somebody that shows up on our radar and they're like, you know, they're trying to reap their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. We've had coaching clients in their 80s, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're saying, look, I know I listen to you guys. I wish I would have listened to you a thousand years ago in some cases. And um, look, I made some mistakes and now I need to figure out a way to make ends meet. Now I need to figure out a way to create financial security for myself. So I cannot separate myself from my uh, 
feeling bad for them. I can't. It's just impossible for me to. I wish I was. Maybe one day I'll be more of a professional where I can be a little bit, you know, removed from that emotional response that I that I innately feel. But for now, I do feel it. And and I I'm glad that they're circling back. I'm hoping that they don't have any of those um, those old uh, you know mooring lines that try to pull them back in the wrong direction. Um, but I'll tell you the ones I'm really excited about mm-hmm. are all the new people getting in the business. Sure. The new people getting in the business who listen to us, who then are choosing what we perce- what we do believe to be the right path now, mm-hmm. those are the ones I'm excited about. Absolutely. And I have to say that if you're somebody that did circle back and maybe you know, you're having some of these aha moments, it's not too late for you. It's not. You just have to make really solid decisions right now. Quickly. Because a few years from now... You know, a few months from now, for some of you, it might be too late. So you do have to be careful of those decisions. But, you know, I guess I'd love them all. <laughs> well, I, I know. You know, the, I feel this is what we way. do. I tell people, don't ask me about anything except, like, you know, first grade classes online <laughs> and real estate. <laughs> well, you and, I are, you and I are incredibly myopic, you know. Yeah. Although but, on the Sunday show, let's give them a, little, a yeah. little prequel for the Sunday show. We do try and think out of the box. We bring you different uh, stories from different genres in life on purpose Partially so that we're thinking bigger and differently for you, and partially to maybe have you have a little chuckle on a Sunday before you start your Monday's work, and we have a lot of fun with that. So you've been warned. I mean, we talk about all kinds of things, Julie, though we didn't do one last Sunday because we were in Palmas, but uh, this, uh, like I try to bring topics that will intentionally try to uh, make Julie experience a little bit of unease (laughs) or embarrassment. And so, but so far I failed, <laughs> truthfully. Get cracking. I thought, I I thought when I, left. I thought when I talked about the booming uh, sex doll sales because of COVID, <laughs> that, that you would, that you would uh, grimace, no. but you didn't, you just blazed right through it. I have immunity to you after this many years. Yeah. 30 years this year, mm-hmm. bud. It takes yep. that long. I know. But yeah, <laughs> does that how long like it took? <laughs> it but I'm not giving up. I know. I am, shouldn't. I am absolutely not giving up and trying to basically cause you to have some sort of audible shock. Yes. I'm going to do it. All right. I'll, come, I'll have to come up with some topic. I've oh, tried no. aliens. Uh, I've tried Bigfoot. I've tried yeah. Uh, everything. Yeah. There has to be something. <gasps> Podcast listeners, if you have any suggestions. Send them to me. <laughs> oh, boy. There it is. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> well, you guys have a fantastic day, and we'll talk with you on the show on Sunday. And the Sunday show is not our regularly scheduled show. It is where Julie said we primarily just focus on things that are designed to expand our thinking and your thinking as well. So join us on Sunday. In the meanwhile, um, please do communicate with us. How can we improve the podcast? What can we do to be more of service to you? If you think we're off base on anything, uh, challenge us. I, I appreciate the, you know, I you heard the question I asked Julie on our walk. You know, we believe what we believe, but is are we right in what we think? You guys should do the same things. But if you see that you think that we're off base, tell us. If you think we're on track, tell us. We need your feedback. Help us to get better at our craft and we'll reciprocate. Uh, you can text me directly at 512-758-0206. But the best way is to give us a five-star review on iTunes, right? That's not asking too much. And don't give us a little lazy four-star. It only <laughs> takes the same effort to click five-star. So give us a five-star review on iTunes. Um, and, you know, we love any ways that you guys give us um, a public acknowledgement of how we've helped you in your business because that encourages others off hopefully uh, what, what unfortunately they might be on the right, the wrong track onto the right track. So reinforce what we're doing and we'll continue to supply with you guys everything we possibly yeah. can to make your personal business lives better. Send us your emails and especially what you've learned from either podcasts or coaching. You never know. You might end up being quoted in one of the books. That's true. Julie's looking for quotes, right? And and uh, it's uh, our website's timandjulieharris.com, timandjulieharris.com. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show on Sunday. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.